Some years ago, when some friends were from Scotland were visiting us, one of the things that struck them most about life in the States is the seemingly unlimited number of choices we have before us each day. The choice conundrum hit them especially hard when they went to the cereal aisle at the grocery store to buy cereal for the child. Oh my goodness, box upon box with fruit or sugar, unsugared, whole grain, special grains, all shapes and sizes. It was overwhelming. And before Starbucks invaded Europe, they were also overwhelmed by the difficulty of what seems to be a simple task of ordering a cup of coffee. I'll take a, oh, a, a grande latte half-calf, half-skim, half 2% half half extra hot with an extra shot and no foam. <laughs> All that for a cup of coffee. Of course, these are insignificant choices. But we're faced with choices every day about life, what sport to play, what instrument to learn, what friends to hang out with, what college to attend. We make significant choices about relationships and money and food and health and family and ethics and exercise. Even churches have to make choices about how they will live out their life before God and how they will use their resources. Tattoos on the Heart is a book by Father Greg Boyle, the founder of Homeboy Industries, located in one of the worst gang-infested neighborhoods in Los Angeles. It's a ministry that embraces both the residents of the local community and the gangs that come and go. It is a place, a spiritual home, in which people are accepted without question and given opportunities to learn a skill and to do work. One morning, Father Greg asked the congregation at morning mass what the church smelled like. There was an awkward pause. And then someone dared to speak the truth. The church smells like dirty feet. What? You see, the church smelled like dirty feet because the congregation had made a choice to invite the homeless in the barrio to sleep there. And so he asked again, what does the church smell like? And the voice rose up from the back, it smells like commitment. And then another voice catching the enthusiasm and the spirit of the moment said, you know, it smells like roses. There are fundamental choices that we make that lie under all the other choices of our lives as individuals, as families, and as a church. Joshua, in the passage we heard read this morning from the last chapter, Joshua puts it this way, Choose you this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Why choose to serve the Lord? Joshua gathering a, a new generation of Israelites there in the promised land. He gathers them at Shechem and he reminds them of all that the Lord has done for them. How the Lord delivered them from the bondage of slavery in Egypt. How the Lord protected them through the wilderness wanderings. How the Lord gave them this good and bounteous land and vineyards they did not plant and olive groves they did not plant and fields, and homes, and cisterns. And now that Joshua is an old man, he wants a new generation to recommit themselves to love and to serve the Lord. And the people remember and recount all that the Lord has done for them. And they too stand with Joshua. We will serve the Lord. It is their profound gratitude for what God has done in their lives that leads them to commit their lives to the Lord. They put their lives in God's hand. They declare that they will, will trust in God for their daily needs. They look to God for their protection and for God's guidance. And this fundamental choice becomes the foundation of all the other choices they will make. 
In the passage we read from Luke's gospel, Jesus puts the same choice before us, but in a different way. He is healing people, and the crowds are marveling at his healing. There's no question about whether or not Jesus is is healing and exercising demons. They see he is doing it. They watch him cast the demon of silence out of a man who cannot speak. No one doubts that he healed the man. But trying to stir up trouble in questions, his critics question by by what authority, by what power does Jesus do this thing? Trying to discredit him, they claim that he heals by the power of the devil. But Jesus wisely counters their illogic by responding that if he heals by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons, then that means the devil is at war with itself and its house will collapse. No. He heals by the power of God, the strong one, the one who is stronger than all the powers of evil. Jesus has swept our houses clean. He's put our spiritual house in order. He has washed away our sins, healed our brokenness, and provided for our needs. God does good things for us. And God is stronger than all those people and forces that seek to wear us down, break our spirits, overcome our faith, destroy our lives. And like those children of Israel gathered together at Shechem so long ago, we stand before the living God and we too are asked what we will do in response to all that God has done for us. Now that God has cleansed the house of our lives, what will we do? With what shall we fill our spiritual home? And the implication of that strange parable that Jesus tells is that if we do not find positive, good, and godly things to fill our lives, then there is a chance that unworthy, deadly things will sneak back in and take over, and it will all be worse than it was before. Now, I don't know about you, but at times, I only want God to dust off my accumulated stuff. I want God to do a little bit of touch-up painting in my life. Maybe rearrange the furniture just a bit, not too much. I don't want God to sweep my life clean, empty the clutter out of my heart, take away my bad habits and desires, or fill my life with the joy of the kingdom. You know, I'm happy enough at Starbucks working on my laptop. I like things pretty way, pretty much the way they are. I want Jesus to make my life just a little bit better, not give me a whole new one. But that's not the gospel. That's not what Jesus does. Jesus gives us a whole new life. He makes a clean sweep of the whole affair. He gives us a new mind and a heart. He puts our feet on a new path. And he invites us to make the fundamental choice of filling our lives with his gifts, his words, his ways. So that the evil we have left behind does not come back in and take possession of us again. Oh, in that book, Tattoos on the Heart, Father Greg writes about a young man named Speedy. Father Greg says that Speedy was the cause of much of his gray hair. Speedy was aptly named. He was fast. And because he didn't value his life, he would risk his life continuously on foolish stuff. He would run into another gang's territory and taunt them and run back home. All for the senseless thrill of it. One day, Speedy came to church to see Father Greg. Father Greg was in the sacristy preparing for Mass. Several in the congregation were already there waiting, and Speedy said these words, I don't really care if I live or die. Caught in that dilemma between responding to Speedy and his obligation to perform the Mass, he just looked at him straight in the eye and said, Speedy, 
I care if you live or die. He goes in to perform the Mass. Several hours later, Speedy returns. He's breathing hard. He's red in the face. Father Greg says, what have you gotten into? Well, it appears he'd walked a girl home who lived in the middle of his enemies. And then he ran, dodging the rocks and the bottles, until he was almost home and there saw a woman named Yolanda. Yolanda was a member of the parish and she knew that Speedy had just been up to no good again. And she said to Speedy, If anything happens to you, it will break my heart in two. And she began to remind him of the good things she sees in his life. She reminded him of how good he is in the park with his nephew and how he helped the church feed the homeless and the hungry. If anything happened to you, it would break my heart in two. And from that moment on, something changed. It was as if Jesus had swept clean the life that he was living, swept clean his spiritual home with the power of his words and driven out the demons of shame and anger and self-contempt and brokenness. And then Speedy decided to begin to fill his life with good things. And this is why he came back to Father Greg to tell him something had changed. Speedy married, moved away, had a family, got a job in an oil refinery. And one year, several years later, Father Greg called Speedy on his birthday just to ask him how he was, and they began to chat. And, and he said, well, what do you do on Sunday with your family, Speedy, when you're not working? He said, well, we go to Mass, and then we go to the cafe, and then we go to the bookstore, you know, one of those big ones where you can kind of be anonymous. And we all pick up a book we like to read and then we go to our separate little corners and read for a couple of hours. Father, you know I'm a little too cheap to buy the books. But we did buy Harry Potter one time. Father Greg said, you've got a good life, don't you, Speedy? And Speedy said, yeah, I do. Jesus wants us to have an abundant life. And in order to have an abundant life, we, we need to fill the spiritual house of our lives that Jesus has swept clean with good things, the treasures of the kingdom. And one of the best choices that we can make in filling out our spiritual house is, is making the choice to worship. But there are all those other things crowding and trying to get back in. We have so many demands on our time. We have the responsibility of heavy work schedules. Why, we got a house and a yard to care for. We have children's sports and lessons and extracurricular activities. We have so many options for travel and for entertainment. It is easy to let these things fill up all space and worship and life together slips out the back door. Spending time with God and with God's people week in and week out is an essential part of, of keeping our spiritual house in order and filling it with good things. If I were to ask you today to, to take out your checkbook, oh, those of you who have checkbooks anymore, and look at how you, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to write a check today, although I could, that would be a good thing. But take out your checkbook, or if you don't have one, go home and look online and look at your bank statement. It gives us a pretty good indication of, of, of our priorities, of how we use our resources. And are we investing simply in entertainment and eating out and buying unnecessary things spending money on our hobbits, hobbies and little to the causes of Christ and giving to the people in great need. For how we spend our money says a lot about whether we will fill our lives with a bunch of stuff. 
or with love and compassion and generosity and sacrifice and the eternal things of God. Today we presented these beautiful children to receive the sacrament of baptism. In the waters of baptism we have a sign of how, how God wipes us clean, washes us clean. How he gives us a place to begin. I have a friend who served as a, as a minister on Long Island and he was from the southern region and when he went up there the culture was different. Imagine that. And so, he said, people would call the church and they would say, hey, we want to do the baby. And he said, what? <laughs> no, 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 it's time to do the baby. What? And he meant, understood finally, he was slow, he was from the south, he understood finally <laughs> that they meant baptize the baby. So they would come to the church and baptize the baby and they got the baby done. And they thought it was over. I tell you, no. It ain't over. Baptism is not an ending but a beginning. For in baptism, Jesus washes the spiritual house clean, sweeps it out, and invites us then to a lifetime pilgrimage of filling the spiritual house of our lives with good things. Of nurturing our children and youth in the ways of Christ. A lifelong process of choosing how we and our children will live before the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And Jesus ends all this with a beatitude. A beatitude for those whose lives have been swept clean. Did you hear it? Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Amen.